I think the council, because the, the early 60s was a time when all these vast sort of uh, city centre schemes were beginning to be thought about, started to be mm -hmm. totally in favour of new buildings, and, and except for the very grand kind of backdrops of the Royal Crescent and things, very much against preserving um, the kind of Georgian infrastructure. I mean, people like David and myself and Derek and Brian and so on, sort of outsiders, you know, coming to Bath and seeing just what an extraordinary city it was. It had these vast, these acres of Georgian property, mm. so that we looked at it in a different way. And I think that the new people <coughs> formed the backbone of the sort of opposition to um, the gradual rape of Bath, which is a popular word for it, which indeed it was. And David belonged to the Preservation Trust and was a, a trustee or an, That's right. And, and I joined the, the trust as a trustee. And the Bath Environmental Campaign. And the Bath campaign. Environmental Campaign was, was started in order to change the mind of opinion in this city and did it in a quite spectacular way. I remember there were many occasions the table was thumped at trust meetings and and, and, and somehow the, the, the fact that a bit of passion was brought back into the argument um, in fact helped uh, people to change their minds because before no one had ever really, the sort of architects who were around in Bath had all kind of said oh yes, yes, yes and, and hadn't really bothered very much. And I think that the fact that I was a developer and was prepared to put my money down on something like Kingsmead Square also helped because yeah, people are always, it, they're always impressed by actual money on the table. You all went into this to acquire Kingsmead Square, to renovate it. Why do you think so many developers are ready to do, to knock down and rebuild? Is it greed or, or lack of Im imagination? Or, or I think the laziness. Much easier. Yeah. Yeah. I think the lack of imagination and the ease of just knocking it down and putting it up. It's very difficult, I think, for a developer concerned with profit and speed and effectiveness of a space to imagine how that, in its state at the time Charles acquired it, could be converted into a really usable and worthwhile. Um, property. No was prepared really to have, have the sort of courage that Charlie's shown and just say, right, it's got to be preserved, now we'll make it tick. And this is really the attitude one needs. Charlie's part in the finances of this festival has been to guarantee us against loss um, and to loan us his, his, uh, his home for a fundraising sort of benefit evening, which was held about a week ago. Do any of the workshops see a clash between what they believe and using property owners like Charlie to support a festival? One isn't really in a position to be choosy these days. Um, you know, if one's going to start actually thinking about where the money's coming from, from any of our sources, one could sort of end up deciding not to do anything at all. I used to uh, do theatre design and things at one time, and um, I was very interested in, um, for instance, Joan Littlewood's early, uh, early efforts at Theatre Workshop down, down in Stratford East, and I used to go down to all the plays, you know, when Brendan Byrne was around and the rest of them. And used to, one used to go in as a rather sort of young student and listen to sort of Jerry Raffles and Joan and um, uh, Brendan Byrne and all these people talking about theatre, you know, about the people's theatre, about community theatre. And I suppose in a way the workshop is very much related to that. <laughs> Good burgers of Bath always have a very weird trip when it comes to the workshop because they're always being they're always being surprised, you know. And you remember the normal, the, the man in the sort of um, stocking, you know, and the hat and the black suit. I mean, you get five of them going, and they really are quite incredible, you know, in the streets, and they surprise people. There's a good deal of coverage in the papers. Some of it very sort of uh, outraged coverage, but. Um, it's sort of very much an established thing, and if it didn't happen, you know, in a way, Bath would be very, 
unhappy. Somehow Bath has always been like a city of anticipation. It's all those incredible buildings that were all set out as one large pleasure palace, a kind of 18th century Las Vegas. It still remains, and somehow even the solid provincial burgers of Bath, you know, they get a buzz out of seeing people in the streets doing things. It's a unique kind of thing. About ten years ago, things were really terrible. I was uh, teaching at Caution at the art school there. But on the side, I had this uh, Irish building firm, which was allegedly being run on socialist lines, you know. If you present that to a uh, sort of Dubliner Irishman, you're just offering them the whole cake. <laughs> and there's no way that you can win. And suddenly I found myself owing about uh, 10 or 12 grand without any means of support. And so I gave up the teaching and went on the tools as a chippy and um, worked my way up by my bootstraps. <laughs> there were two other guys and we just did little building jobs, you know, little conversions for smart trendies moving into Islington. 1964 this was, the start of the great years. Then it moved forward by hard work, like Samuel Smiles. How did you get out of being a builder? Well, really, into through... being a property developer by getting hold of a good idea and selling it. In other words, by finding something and then setting it up. In those days, if you went to a bank with a good idea, but without any collateral, they'd give you money to develop it, would they? Yeah, if it was a good idea, they'd say, well, look, this house is worth four, five thousand, but um, it's being bought for two thousand or something. Suddenly, all these slums became sort of fashionable to live in. Obviously, prices did go up a lot ahead, so that when dealers and things were selling their houses, you know, they often just didn't know the value. In about 68, it really just took off, you know. It just took off. When did you first think, Christ, I'm, I'm rich? People say, oh, that's Charlie Ware, you know, things like that. And that's fame, I suppose, when you hear someone actually talking about you, and they say they've met you, and you don't know who they are, you know. Some, I heard someone in a bar talking about Charlie Ware, you know. And I thought, uh, that's fame. <laughs> it's untrue what they're saying about me, says Mr Ware. The gossips are busy. That man, what's his name, buys up bath houses and announces big plans, and then there's a theatre royal. What about that? Don't do it, says Lord Goodman. Lord Goodman, ex-chairman of the Arts Council, today joined in a controversy over property developer Charles Ware's takeover bid for the Bath Theatre Royal, and warned him against trying to run it without a subsidy. I am terrified at the suggestion that the idea is not to run a repertory theatre but a general purposes entertainment centre. These have a special quality of disaster. It would be grievously wrong in Bath. Well, I must say, that was a bit of old nonsense. Well, there was a bit of trouble.